Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today we are happy to have Professor Daniel Planario as a speaker in this new talk of our seminar series. Daniel received his uh, PhD in 1997 from the University of Toronto. He also did a postdoc in the University of Waterloo, and now he's a professor at the School of Mathematics and Statistics in Carleton University. He's mostly interested in the theory, algorithms, and applications of algebra, combinatorics, and number theory. And today he's going to talk about uh, irreducible polynomials over finite fields commonly used in cryptography. Before starting with this talk, uh, I would like to remember the audience that uh, we have a Q&A chat where you can just write your questions to the speaker. We will try uh, to answer them uh, during the talk, or otherwise, uh, Daniel will have a look at them uh, at the end of this session. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, that's it. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, please, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Santos, and thank you, Mark, for the invitation to be here. Um, when, you, when I got the invitation, I, I was not sure what to talk, maybe one thing or another, maybe a paper or something more general. So in, in the end, um, my talk will be about um, irreducible polynomials over finite fields. Um, and especially when you are interested in, in producing arithmetic for some cryptographic uh, system. Um, so the, the so there are several keywords here, like, you know, uh, finite fields, uh, you know, and and irreducible, but um, I hope this will be um, will be clear in, in, in this outline of my talk. So the first thing I will do, and it will be quite quick actually, I will not spend a lot of time on this. I hope uh, it will be on on you know okay. First of all, putting putting uh, this talk into place. You know, we're talking about finite fields. So why? Well, it turns out that they are used in cryptography. In one slide, I'll show you some applications. You probably know more. And there are a lot more than the ones that I'm putting. It's just, you know, just to show that there is an interest on these objects from algebra. Um, I need some background, but it will be really like one slide again, because I, I there is a lot of, you know, theory of finite field, but I will only be referring to this corner of irreducible polynomials of interest uh, in some applications. So I will be very, very short on the background. Um, and then I will go to the to the main part of this first uh, chunk here, that is uh, the, the polynomial representation. There will be different ways of representing the elements. And uh, the one that we will care here in this talk, you know, is one of the most important ones, but not the only one, is uh, polynomial representation. And there you will see that you need irreducible. The irreducible somehow is hanging there. You know, when you have a representation of of some finite field, there is, if it's an extension that you'll talk about in a minute, you will need some irreducible polynomial. And, and you really depend on that. You know, your representation depends on what irreducible you choose. So, so that brings us into the, basically everything that you need in the title, that are these irreducible polynomials. And then I will go into what has happened more or less in the, in the past. There has been a lot of focus on a particular type of polynomials, irreducible polynomials. In particular, we are working over F2. Um, so this is kind of the, the most interesting or most applied case. So for those things here, you're interested in polynomials that have what we call low weight. So in other words, you need, you need to prescribe the coefficient. It will not be any irreducible, not any polynomial. I mean, that is an irreducible. You, you will be interested in using. You will be interested in using ones that are some more efficient. And you know that opens the door to a lot of things. Efficient uh, on where, you know, what is your architecture? Is in software? Is in hardware? It's a lot of uh, issues that come up when you open the door. But uh, you know, you're interested in general with not any irreducible, but some particular shape of the irreducibles. And in particular, having studied a lot trinomials and pentanomials that I will comment more. This kind of will be the, the largest part of my talk. And then I don't know if I will have time, but if I have time, very shortly with other things because you may want to just have an irreducible. Maybe you are not interested in doing implementation on, on the arithmetic, but you need an irreducible for doing something else. And this is, you know, irreducible polynomials are very useful. <laughs> so it could happen. If that happened, then maybe you're happy to just run in an algorithm that is efficient and find the one 
of the degree and the field that you want. In this finite field, this degree of irreducible polynomial. As we will comment later, there are irreducible polynomials of any degree over any finite field. So, uh, so that is kind of uh, not a mute question. You, you want any finite field you want, there is an irreducible. There are more than one. There are a lot of irreducibles of that degree over that finite field that you pick. So the question is, you can find some quickly. Yes, you can. There are some algorithms for doing that. Uh, there are, I will not have time for this, but th there are also direct constructions. So you can say, okay, I want an irreducible over F2 of degree 324. Can I do nothing? <laughs> can I, you know, I don't want to search in the table or whatever. I want to apply a theorem here that I will be just checking some GCD conditions and numbers, very simple, very fast conditions, say, yeah, this polynomial here is irreducible. And, you know, basically at no cost or very, very, very reduced cost. And there are constructions like that that will produce you some irreducible, but not for all degrees, uh, only for some degrees. And you can, you can produce this direct construction, very cheap construction, um, even a family of them. So you can have many of them. So, okay, so my, my main part that I will be talking more is this, the, the prescribed part, trinomials especially. And very quickly now I will do an introduction to, to finite fields, as I said, uh, you know, very quick. First, first thing, just in one slide, uh, you know, why finite fields in tutorial? Well, this is quite old. It's used, you know, heavily in many, many methods, constructions, you know, cipher, crypto systems, attack, you know, in, in many, many things you end up needing a finite field arithmetic to, to, to use, you know, in, in your computer to, to run your algorithms or, or have your hardware. So here are some lists, as I said, this is by no means a complete list. You have classical crypto systems, you know, especially as related to, to public key cryptography, you know, Diffie-Helm and El Gamal, things like this. Elliptic curves and all curve cryptography, you know, you will have arithmetic over finite fields. There are many other systems, isolated systems. Some of them get some relevance like Michaelis that get a lot of relevance because of post-quantum. It's also based on, on finite fields. So you have a lot of methods, many more that I'm citing here. Also, um, discrete logs, in, in general, if you are running sort of in the calculus methods and variants of that, you, well, depends on your group, but most likely you will be needing uh, finite fields there. Ciphers of many types, especially, for example, AES, right? Um, there is a lot of um, hardware and software arithmetic. I will really, touch it in, in the main part of the talk, but it's really, there is a lot more studies, you know, about selecting uh, an irreducible that is good. And it turns out that, uh, you know, historically they have been like um, standardizations, right? So suggestions by IEEE, by, by you know, NIST, uh, even by companies that were suggesting, no, you need to use this polynomial, this irreducible polynomial here over F2 of degree 239, whatever, right? 155, and they say, okay, and you need to use this polynomial. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of um, uh, something that happened 20 years ago. Um, so, uh, so there is a lot of things of how can I do implementations over that particular polynomial? How can I get this? And in this particular uh, hardware, I'm doing FPGA, whatever, you know, how can I do? So there are innumerable, innumerable papers on, on, on arithmetic and, and, and you know, what is the best possible? Is it really not clear because it's best depending on um, you know your your system, your hardware, you know, and so on. And there is also more recently, as uh, you know, uh, probably everyone knows here, there is this whole area of post quantum cryptography, right? That uh, you know there are several methods, in particular in the NIST competition, um, and in most of them you will see finite field. In some of them you will see a lot of finite field, like multivariate crypto systems, you know. Uh, and code based, they, they are heavily used, uh, you know, a lot of either code, code based or multivariate polynomials or finite fields. But in any case, you will be using finite fields. Isogenous is sort of a limited area in elliptical that somehow has remained in the post quantum area. And there you will also use. And in lattice based, I put it here, I doubt it. First, I didn't have it, then I put it. Um, basically, in lattice based, there is only one method that really uses, uh, you know, finite fields that is entry prime. But, um, but the other methods of lattice is mostly the ones based on N2. Um, you know, okay, they're not finite fields directly, but they are really close 
to, to that. So I, I included here, even though it's kind of not comparable to this. If you go to multivariate crypto system, then there is a lot of finite field that you need. Well, if you go to lattices, well, it depends on your system. But anyway, this is just a slide to tell you that finite fields are used in cryptography. So uh, one slide to, okay, I say what is finite field? What is a finite field? Well, uh, you know, probably you know, but in any case, what is a field first? It's just a set of elements with two operations, addition and product. And you need to have some operation of a group, commutative group with addition, meaning that when you sum two elements, it's an element in the set. When you do associativity, you doesn't matter where you put the parentheses, it's, it's the same thing. And there is an identity there that is zero. And there is a, a, an inverse that is the opposite number, right? So A plus B equal to zero. So there's B minus A. And uh, that's with respect to the first operation. With respect to the second one, you need to remove zero because you will not have inverse of zero. There is no number. So the identity here is one, and there is no number that multiplied by zero will be one. So you need to remove zero, and you remove zero. And then everyone else have a multiplicative inverse and all the properties that I just commented, and you have distributivity. Typical example, real numbers, complex numbers, rational numbers, right? Now, we are interested in this thing here, but in one more thing here, the number of elements, the cardinality of this set has to be finite. And that's the only thing that differentiates a finite field from uh, the rationals, okay? So you have a finite number of elements. And the typical example, the first example that you see is when you consider the integers modulo a number n, the operation you can do addition and multiplication. You just need to uh, apply the modular operation, right? And then this gives you a class of equivalence. You normally pick as a representative the remainder of the division by p. And it turns out that you have a field if and only if the number that you are taking the modulus is a prime number. And if it is a composite number like six, then it is not because things fail there. Like you get number two or number three, there will be no inverse. No number multiplied by two will be one in Z6 when you operate modulo six. And that happened for any composite number, N equal A times B, A and B between one and N, right? In the middle. So uh, what happened with FP? That's my only line about FP arithmetic because I, I will be talking about irreducible polynomials. I will not be talking about this case is that you can do what I just said, modulo P, modular arithmetic, yeah? You do some and product like that. There are some issues when you implement this in cryptography because the P in cryptography will be a huge, massive P with, you know, way larger than what you fit in a word. So then there is a, a issues about how to implement in this efficiently, you know, and, and but this uh, is well, well studied and well known. And it's not the focus on my uh, problem here because what I'm interested in is in the cases when you have P to the N elements. So it turns out that there is a theorem that says that finite fields exist and they are unique up to isomorphism. So they are all isomorphic, but they exist, you know, if and only if actually you have a Q that is a power of a prime to a number N. So P has to be a prime number like two, that's the case of interest in this talk. And N is, you know, any, positive integer, you will want bigger than one. So, so is, this is really uh, what we call an extension field. So it has two to the, for example, uh, 155 elements, okay? And there is two notions that I need, the characteristic notion that says that, and that's the, the big difference with, with the rational numbers, the real numbers and the infinite fields is that in finite fields, when you sum one plus one plus one a certain number of times, you will get zero. And how, how many times? P times, P is the value here. So in the case of F2, of our index, one plus one will be zero. And this corresponds to the exclusive order operation, okay? So this is in the case of two, but this in general for any prime number P. And two properties that exist, you know, in a finite field with P to the n elements or P or whatever, in any finite field with Q elements, any element A in the field, when you raise it to Q, give you A. So you don't need to go beyond Q because there is a reduction. If you, what if I have A to the Q plus three? Well, it's A to the Q times A to the three, to the Q is A. So A times A to the three is A to the four. So there is, you never go above Q because at Q you return. And that's a fact that happens because we are in the finite world. And so we have this property. And this property then carries on to many things. The most famous is this one, freshman dream that if you have a binomial to a power of the characteristic P, then the middle terms are zero and you only get this. Or freshman dream because, you know, the high school kids, right? 
a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. No, that's wrong, but here is fine. Okay, so, so this is the typical properties that you use. And the last thing about this, so we can move to the polynomial basis, is that when you are working on these FQNs or FPNs, you can see this as a vector space, so linear algebra first year, a vector space of dimension n over FQ. This is true, you can check the properties. So that means that we can represent the elements in this extension p to the n uh, using a basis of n linearly independent vectors. So my vectors live in FQN and my scalars, my constants are in FQ because it's over FQ. And so if you have a basis and here is one basis, alpha, alpha Q, alpha Q to the minus one, if these n elements are linearly independent, they are n guys in FQN, they will form a basis of FQN over FQ. And if that happened, this basis is called normal basis. The element here alpha is called normal element. This is, for example, one example of basis. This is quite important for uh, if you are using discrete log, because if you use this arithmetic, it's well known since the 90s that you can do very efficient exponentiation. So your exponentiation can be done essentially like a product. It's the same, doing an exponentiation, basically the same as doing just one multiplication. But you need to use this arithmetic, otherwise this is not true. Um, and so when, when you have these methods, pre-post-quantum, pre-post-quantum, right? Um, where you have the, the discrete log being your, your, your security side, you have a one-way function, exponentiation is easy to compute, discrete log, the inverse is hard. Well, if you have this basis, your exponentiation will be extremely fast. So that's one basis, and you can have any basis you want. And in particular, the basis we want in this talk, and this is one of the most used bases are called polynomial bases. Okay, so what are, the, what are the polynomial bases? Well, the polynomial bases exist <laughs> because there is a theorem that says that if you have, uh, you know, the ring of polynomials, you will be dealing with polynomials now uh, with coefficients in FQ. And you consider what in algebra is called the quotient ring of the ring of polynomials by the idea generated by F. If you do that, that in terms of implementation, things like this, it's just basically reducing modulo F and getting the representative to be, for example, the remainder of the division. Because this polynomial here has degree n, the remainder will have degree up to n minus one. So it's a polynomial from degree zero to degree n minus one. For each position, you have q values. So you have q to the n values. So this thing here, when you do this ring and you do the quotient ring by f, you have q to the n equivalent classes, right? So q to the n elements. Turns out that this is a field, and there's a theorem, a classical theorem in, in algebra that says that if your f is irreducible, this is a field. If your f is not irreducible, this is not a field. So it's an if and only if. So in other words, if I get an irreducible polynomial of degree n, I can have a way of representing the elements in fq to the n by using polynomials of degree strictly smaller than n. And I sum, like I sum polynomials, and I multiply, I can multiply polynomials. When I sum two polynomials of degree up to n minus one, nothing can happen. But when I multiply, I can go beyond degree n, and then you reduce by dividing by f and taking the remainder, if the remainder is your representative for, for the class. So these are called polynomial bases. What are polynomial bases? Then s. You have your finite field fq. In our case, it will be f2. You will grab a polynomial that is irreducible of degree 324 that exists over F2 and over F2. So you grab this irreducible there, and then you do define the finite field F2 to the 324 by operating with polynomials. And that's the basis we'll be talking about. We'll not be talking about other bases. As I said, there are other bases, and there are other important bases, like the normal bases. But I'll be talking about only the polynomial case. So that's what we call the polynomial representation of elements of finite fields, uses polynomial bases and attaches an irreducible. If you change the irreducible, you change the representation. So the theorem says that any irreducible, they are isomorphic. Mathematically, you are done with the theorem that was proven in 1850. But computationally, software, hardware, whatever, it really varies depending on the irreducible that you pick. So picking in different irreducibles will lead into different representation with different costs. And then the question is, what is the best cost? 
And that's not an easy question to answer because there is a lot of dependencies on, uh, you know, your, your, the problem that you're interested. Maybe, maybe you're interested in some operations only, or maybe, you know, you have certain type of hardware, you know, it depends on, on, on things to answer that question. So, but that's what, uh, you know, why we are talking, why I'm talking today about irreducible polynomials, because we want to somehow have F2 to the, uh, you know, some number, 155 or whatever. Just before I, I, I go further, you know, don't, don't get fooled yourself if this is the first time you're seeing this type of things that, you know, two to the 155 is a massive, massive finite field. So if you want to run over every element in a finite field in a computer like my laptop here, I cannot go beyond two to the 40 using very fast algorithms. If I use better, uh, better computers in my university, then I can go to 245 maybe. 48, maybe, maybe, no, no, maybe not, 45. If I use the best computers that we have access in Canada, we have some center for professors can use for Compute Canada, then I can go a little bit further to 50 maybe, I don't know. And, uh, and this is 155, I say, or 324 or two to the 1024. So this is a humongous finite field, way, way uh, huge. So visiting all elements, for example, is out of the question. You are in an exponential situation if you do that. So, um, so the, the irreducible matters because it, it, it will really reduce, it could potentially reduce considerably the cost that you have, okay? So, all right, so, so um, very quick. So you have, for example, you know, a, a four, if you want to have a four, it's two to the two. You need an irreducible degree two. This is an irreducible degree two, can be easily checked. And with that, your, your elements then are, Polynomials of degree is strictly smaller than two and with coefficients zero, one because they are in F2. So the polynomials are zero, one, X and X plus one. Those are my four elements. And you can quickly have your table for some product. For them, you can see here in the product that if you forget about zero, forget about zero, because zero sort of in the product annihilates, right? Everyone else, if you grab an X, there is an element that multiplied by X will be one. So if I X times X plus one, I get X squared plus X. But that's degree two, I need to divide by x squared plus x plus one. The remainder will be one. So a, the inverse of x is x plus one. The inverse of x plus one is x because the, the group is commutative, right? So it has to be you know, a reflection here. Um, and you can see that there are ones on every place. There are invertible elements for every non-zero element and so on. You also see f2 here, because if you take a look at zero one, just this square here, this is the, the addition that is the exclusive order, right? One plus one is zero. In F2. And here is the ant. So you see that F2 is inside F4, right? As a sub, as a subfield. But uh, but this is not set four. This is not set four because as I said, if you get up two or three, when you write down zero, one, two, three, and do two times zero, zero, two times one, two, two times two, four, that is set four is zero, and two times three, six, that is two. So you, you only see zero and two, for example. So this is not set four, and you cannot equate. F4 to Z4, even though you can equate to Z2. Fp and Zp, yes, but not Fp to the n with Zp to the n if n is bigger than one. That's not true because this is not even a field. So you really need this, this uh, finite fields to do the implementation because you need inverses. In most applications, you will need multiplicative inverses and that bring you into the finite fields. So it's a theorem that says that there are irreducible polynomials of any degree over any finite field. And, um, and this, because this polynomial is used in the reduction, a lot of thought has been put into which are the best polynomial for the reduction. And as I said two or three times already, this is not a simple question. But uh, in any case, in many, uh, many applications, let's say, it has been used trinomials over F2. Trinomials are polynomials that have three terms. And because they have degree n, they have an x to the n. Because they have to be reducible, they need to have a one. Because if they don't have a one, they have a zero. There is an x that you can pull. And so the polynomial is reducible. So you need to have an x to the n and a one. So the only question is where x to the k lives. And it could live anywhere. And, um, and, and you know there are a lot of questions about the, the trinomials. And it turns out that there are no trinomials for any degree n. It is not even clear that they are the best. There are papers that show that there are trinomials and other constructions, and the other constructions are better for some particular arithmetic. So 
but in general, you, you can see most method taking trinomials if they exist. And if not, they go to pentanomials. And it turns out that for degree eight, there are no trinomials because indeed there's a theorem that says that for any degree multiple of eight, and that includes all the word sizes, 32, 64, yeah, and bytes eight, there are no irreducible trinomials. So the suggestion is to go to pentanomials and for example, AES, work with this pentanomial because there are no trinomials. So I work with this pentanomial here. And this pentanomial has another issues too. You can see that the, all the ones are on the bottom part in the low lexicographical order. And, um, and that's also not clear. You can have higher degrees that are better. Degree eight is too small. You can run them all, it's very easy. But if you go to X to the 32, X to the 64, now you have tons of polynomials, tons of polynomials. Two to the sixty-four polynomials, so you have a lot of polynomials, and then uh, you know uh, it, it's not clear anymore that putting the ones on the bottom will be good, and there are examples that is not. But still, in the recommendations that I was saying around twenty years ago by NIST, by by IEEE, by some companies that were suggesting polynomials to use, they will suggest, and many papers too, they will suggest oh, pick them. You know, the ones pick them on the bottom if you can. So there is an intuition that if, this is the guy that you're dividing, right? So you have a polynomial, you're dividing by this one. And so if you have sort of bottom, there is a sort of jump down. So you expect that the degrees of the, you need to reduce, right? The degrees that are on the top down and they will be a, a faster way if you do that. It's, it's not true in general and it's not clear, but in many, uh, many situations it, it is good. So it ended up being a, a general suggestion that, uh, that is a doubtful suggestion, okay? So this brings you into the prescribed coefficients. And first, quickly, we do know, you know, the number of irreducible polynomials of degree n over fq is a formula, it's a closed formula that is proven in a course in undergraduate of the things. So first of all, what is a polynomial that is irreducible? It's like a number that is irreducible, right? So if you can write it as a product of two things, two polynomials, uh, then one of them must be a constant, might be in fq. So there's no way of breaking it into meaningful parts, degrees from one to a strictly smaller than the degree of the polynomial. If there is no way of doing that, so it's kind of a negative way of defining, uh, then your polynomial is irreducible. And we do know this formula since uh, 180 years now. So well-known formula for number of irreducibles, but that's not what I care, because what I care is with prescribed coefficient. I want to put I don't want to use any irreducible. If I use any irreducible, this will be bad. The arithmetic will be bad. So I need to somehow pick better polynomials, irreducible polynomials. So the question is, that, do they exist? <laughs> it turns out that, uh, you know, mathematically proving this is a, is a hard question. Um, there was a conjecture by Hansen and Mullen, very, very mild conjecture, I would say. The conjecture said, can we fix one coefficient of a polynomial to one value in the finite field, a fixed value, zero, or any value, and irreducible exist. Turns out that this was, it was a very weak conjecture in a way, so it was proven quickly, but there were many other conjectures here in these papers that <laughs> they're still open here today. So for example, you can have more than, than one irreducible and so on. There are many generalizations of this. So what is the best proven, proven, mathematically proven thing we know? You can, about half of the coefficients you can prescribe. So uh, this kind of a picture, you can prescribe uh, a lot in the bottom and top, or you can pre prescribe by chunks, you can prescribe places, you can do a lot of things, but the total number is a little bit less than n over two that you can really prescribe. So you say, again, uh, 1,024. Then I can prescribe 512 minus uh, 10, so 502. Yeah? Now, that's fine, but what is the practical? I, I wanted to prescribe everyone to zero, but three or but five. So I really want to prescribe n, not n over two, n minus three or n minus five. So I really want to prescribe everyone and there is no proof of that. And indeed, we are very far from proving, as you can see, we're very far from proving that result. But on the other hand, what you really are more interested because of these suggestions in the practice, do you use trinomial, pentanomial, is to prescribe a lot of zeros. Prescribe to zero, actually. Prescribe and prescribe to zero, a lot of the coefficients. And that defines what is called the low weight. It's a loose term that says essentially most are prescribed, where you're leaving free 
how many you're prescribing. So what if two, three, and five is the you know, most used things, but not the only ones. There are other constructions using other type of uh, you know, prescribe, prescribe. And um, you know, for example, you know, Scott in 2007 showed that irreducible with the optimal perf performance for a given implementation, he has actually several different uh, uh, hardware that he's using and he's using word computations. And he shows that, you know, most of the things that were suggested are true. You have pentanomials that are better than trinomials and things like that. So, um, so this is kind of a, a loose suggestion that it has been massively used. <laughs> if you go to papers, you will see tons of papers on pentanomials and suggested and so on. So there are conjectures. Let me probably skip this in, you know, you can check that later. The conjectures are wide open. They are all open and they will be open for a while because they are quite old. Some of these conjectures like the trinomials started in 1950s and 60s, 50s and 60s. And we still don't know the density of the trinomials. Apparently it's about 50% of the end that we have trinomials experimentally and running up to 120,000 over F2, but it's not clear that uh, this is the degree of the polynomial. Clear that maybe at the degree one million, something happens and you know, whatever. So there are a lot of questions that are not known. I, I will skip this, just I left it here in case someone is interested. I show you what, you know, for example, we have this result that is very important in, in the practical side that you cannot have trinomials with degree multiple of eight. And this is kind of what he proved it. This is an elementary number theory proof that says that if you have a trinomial like that, then you know you will be reducible because the number of irreducible then. So the proof doesn't prove that something is irreducible. It proves that something must be reducible because it checks the number of factors. There is a way of checking how many factors this polynomial has, irreducible factors. Or you can have an even number. Well, if you have an even number, you cannot have one <laughs> that is irreducible case. So by that type of uh, ideas, you can prove then uh, using uh, number theory that, for example, there are no multiples of eight. So, so AES has to go into this pentanomial next to the eight. If you are working in, in 64 bits, then you will not have, you will need to go to, to a pentanomial or some other form of the polynomial. And this is kind of very, very well understood. These are theorems that you know, one can prove. Problem is that these theorems, uh, you cannot really generalize and prove, for example, for pentanomials. It's wide open, you know, which families of pentanomials are reducible. For example, we know some families that are reducible, but uh, you know, very far from knowing the whole picture of pentanomials, for example. So going into, into the, the polynomials that are really used, that are, I, as I was suggesting, most of the papers talks about uh, trinomials and pentanomials, but actually there are many more. There are some polynomials that are called equally spaced polynomials, where you have you know, the, the degrees of the polynomial, you can have many terms, but they are all like this. One, x to the a, x to the 2a, x to the 3a, x to the 4a, x to the 5a, x to the... So they jump by a. And you can have many, not, not five, you can have tons of them. Something called all one polynomials. That is a polynomial that actually is the opposite of sparse, it's full of ones. And uh, you know, there are some papers that show that you, you can say with that polynomial too. So there are many, many things beyond the trinomial and pentanomial, but you know, sort of trinomial and pentanomial have been the preferred ones, I can say, in a light way. And um, and in particular, trinomials are completely understood. So there is a paper by Gu, 2002, that the complexity of using trinomials, a generic trinomial. And so we know the number of uh, shores, right? Exclusive ors and ands that you will use. We know the delays that you will produce if you're doing this in hardware and, and, and so on. I would say, I will focus here on pentanomial. My, my comment will be, my center will be in pentanomial. But uh, for people interested, you can go on this. I leave some reference, not many at the end, but this is one that probably is good for people to check. That is this survey of Fan and Hassan, 2015 for the 20 years of the journal Final Fields and their applications. And, um, and it's an excellent source. It has tons of reference to, to hardware, uh, you know, implementations of this type of polynomials, advantages of this over that. And so, so and for example, I took from there, this one's here, but there are many more there. So if you focus on pentanomials, because that's what I will be doing in the next minutes, then these are some pentanomials that have been studied. 
The first one is kind of the, 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 the okay, if I want to have a trinomial, what is the next equal of a trinomial? Well, pick the guy in the middle, pick just beside them. So instead of having x to the m, x to the b, and one, do x to the m, x to the b, and one, but do also put x to the b minus one and x to the b plus one. You're thinking that these three together easily and, and reduce operations when you divide by this polynomial, right? And, um, and, and that was studied. Um, then you say, okay, but maybe this is too much to ask because you need to be reducible, remember. The polynomial has to be reducible and the degree that you want m. So, you know, the, the, the family you present, then you need to show that there are guys because maybe you present a beautiful family that has cost zero, but it turns out that there are no irreducibles on that family. Then it doesn't matter, right? So you, so yeah, so then you study a number of irreducibles and you say, okay, maybe I can do better if I start shifting a bit things. And then for example, having studied this one, where you put the same distance here, one X, you put the same distance on the BB plus one. And B is their parameter here. The M is sort of fixed, is the degree that you want. And the one and X are fixed, are the two in the bottom. And then the only question is, where do I put the next one? So I can vary B in this range. And I see if there are irreducibles of that shape. And then I see that the arithmetic will save. Um, another one is to get in sort of C on the bottom and M minus C on the top. So it's sort of symmetric on the bottom and top and the B that you run in the middle, uh, things like that. Um, this is the most generic case. So the, this is here, I'm not saying anything, ABCs, because there are many papers that just talk about a generic ABC now is any value, up to M over two. So you are putting on the bottom there. There are issues of reciprocal problem. I don't want to enter, but you can do reciprocal things for, for irreducibles. If you have an irreducible F, then the reciprocal polynomial, that is to say, write it the other way around, um, is irreducible too. And uh, so you, you, you can use things like this and stop in halfway. There have been uh, these type of things that are uh, sort of equal spaces. Here is the equal spaces, really. You do C to C, 3C, 4C pentanomial, so you have only four. You have been septanomial with two more, X to C, X to C. And here is sort of the same thing, but coming from the top, not exactly because at the bottom is different, but you start from the top and you go down S to S, 3S, and then I need a one because need to be reducible. So I break the pattern there. And you know, there are many more. These papers I'm citing here are from these people here. And, um, and if you go to the survey or from the survey to the original papers, you can see the advantage and disadvantage of these things, uh, of these different uh, pentanomials proposed. I, I will talk about one uh, proposal that we have, uh, you know, with uh, Gustavo Vanegas and Ricardo Custodio. Um, so before I go there, you, I will be focusing on, on the multiplication and reduction. You can say, well, you know, the, the you're reducing by this polynomial, but the, this is just the reduction after you did something else, right? So when you got a polynomial that is above M, you need to divide by this polynomial. And you are saying, which is the best pentanomial that I can pick to do the division to get some advantage somewhere, maybe in terms of the number of, of XORs and, and you know, ants, maybe the, in terms of uh, the, the delay that it has, you know, the, the, time, the time complexity or the space complexity, or, or maybe it's power consumption. There are other measures, right? So you, in general, you will have a, a multiplication first. And the multiplication will sort of go above M and then you need to produce the reduction. So that shows that many algorithms are sort of, depending on how they are. Some algorithms are what they are called one step and some algorithms are two step. The one step algorithm, there are, there are many studies in, 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 in papers that do the following. When you multiply, you are doing the multiplication. And at some moment you realize that when I multiply these two fellas, I will go above M. Then I will reduce right away. So you do multiplication and reduction at the same time. You multiply and reduce, and you do like that. And there are many algorithms like this. And other algorithms are separated steps. So they say, okay, I'm really caring about the reduction here and the multiplication is done there. So you do the multiplication and then the reduction. And then you can, for example, change the multiplication by another multiplication algorithm, by another multiplier, right? And then you keep your reduction because you're always using this pentanomial here. And then, um, and then this, this derives two classes of algorithms, uh, you know, okay. And there are advantage and disadvantage on both. In general, the, the, the performance of this multiply and reduce immediately, don't let it grow, don't let it grow. 
you grow a little bit, reduce it, are kind of uh, uh, very efficient. The two steps have the advantage that you can actually do other things, like for example, lazy reduction methods that you, know, you can take advantage of that and they have been used, for example, in these papers in, in, in chess. Um, so there, there, are, there are advantages and disadvantages on, on, on the methods that, that you do. In the case of the paper I will comment, that is this one here in, the, in this journal, cryptographic engineering, right? Um, is this pentanomial that was proposed by us? Um, as you can see, you have one, you have two parameters, B and C, but then the other two are formed. You can see that our M's are fixed because in the moment that you define your B and C to be something, your 2B plus C is fixed. I'm not getting for every M. I'm getting for every M depending on B and C. M equal to B plus C, so it depends on B and C. And, um, and you need to show that this exists, so we show that there are tons of irreducibles with this shape, um, so that's fine. Um, I would say that um, in terms of complexity, um, our, our proposal here is theoretical. We didn't go and implement it in FPGA or in something, right? So, um, so we focus on the number of exclusive orders that you have, and, and, and we actually managed to do give exact estimates. So the theorem will say exactly the number of operations that reducing by this polynomial here will take. Um, and we focus on number of shorts and ants, but you can focus also in computer words spent and so on. So there are many other, uh, other ways like this paper by, by uh, Tomas Oliveira, uh, or Julio Lopez and Francisco Rodriguez Enriquez, for example, and so on. So there are many other, many other papers doing uh, other type of consideration, but many and maybe most will consider this sort of bit, you know, bit parallel, uh, you know, complexity that, that you have. So talking about this polynomial here, then um, you have two different steps in our case. So the multiplier, you can do something and the reduction is the part that I want to focus. The multiplier, which is in the paper, which just put the Karatsuba algorithms. There are many implementations of Karatsuba. There are many, uh, you know, there is a, there is a paper in crypto 2009, I think, by Bernstein that, that show it that you can actually do implementations of Karatsuba much better. If you go inside the formulas, you can really get a, a better Karatsuba um, implementation. And this has been improved by Negre and by several other, other people. Um, so, um, so Karatsuba is a standard uh, things these days in these implementations. Um, and that's the one, the multiplier that we use it. In, in our implementation, the cost of the Karatsuba um, has, has a constant. The constant is, uh, it varies depending on the N. Actually, let me show you. So it varies like this. So depending on your degree, this is the constant C of the Karatsuba. And uh, so it, it flips like that. This is typical Karatsuba thing because it's fractal. But you know, I assume that people know Karatsuba is a divide and conquer algorithm that uses basically N, N over two and N over two. But because your end may not split perfectly, you, you really are using floor of n over two and ceiling of n over two. And that introduces sort of shaky thing because it depends on the value that you are. For example, these values that are locally optimal, these values here, are power of two minus one, and that you can prove. <laughs> but what happened above is less clear. But there are you know, mathematical papers studying merge sort, other algorithms that are of this sort of divide and conquer structure halfway. And, uh, and there is a fractal situation like this coming that you can analyze mathematically, you know, uh, very exactly. So this is not surprising. The interesting thing is that our constant is sort of uh, low or high, depending on how you think, but between four and six in for any practical values that you may want. Um, but for example, other implementations of Karatsuba have better constant. So, so I think the best I saw is 3.75, but uh, Depends on the implementation that you have. Depends on, on where you are implementing things and so on. So, so that comes, this is this is definitely implementation dependable. This is not, you know, something mathematically you can prove, you know, a formula. But the, you know, when you implement it, there are issues, right? So, so in in our case, we just show it that the C is somehow between four and six, and um, and then you have the typical Karatsuba cost m to logarithm of three in base two. And here is the part of our cost. Normal, many papers talk about big O of M. They just say big O of M. We actually go on in, uh, uh, some papers know, some papers give you the precise estimate. But I mean, in our case here, we give the precise estimate and we show that it's exact 
3m minus 2, if you use this pentanomial, and b is different from 2c. If b is equal to 2c, there is an extra uh, economy that you get, and you get uh, 2.4m minus 1. But this, if you forget about this case, that b is 2c, then you, that is this, there are some irreducible, but there are not many. Like this, there are tons of irreducible. So this is your more general case. Um, you get a, a 3m minus 2 cost of the reduction fixed. And it's actually, uh, you know, is, 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 you know, the algorithm is very trivial. This is, is a straight line program, as they call it. So there are no ifs or whatever. And, you know, it's constant time and, you know, 3m minus 2 uh, exclusive word operation, no ands, only exclusive word operation, 3m minus 2. So, so the total cost is the sum of the two costs, right? And, uh, and the interesting part is really in dealing with the, this 3m minus 2, how you get this number to be 3m minus 2. And, um, uh, and as I was saying, it's constant time because it's fixed, it's 3m minus 2, always, independent of the irreducible that you use in this family. So if your m is some value m to b plus c, then the cost is 3m minus 2, and you can pick any polynomial in your family that you want. And we show that there are many irreducibles well, for M low, no, for M low, there are few because life in finite fields is like that, right? When you, your degree is low, there are few. But when you go into some degree like more interesting use, I was saying in the 200, 300 or more, then there are tons of irreducibles of this shape and all of them. So you can sort of flip the, the irreducible. You can, you can use any irreducible from the family it will give you the same cost in terms of number of shows, okay? We didn't talk at all about the power consumption. That is a very important thing. And we didn't do it in this paper. This is kind of more the, the theoretical side of proving exact you know, number of operations. So, so it's another corner. If you implement this, then there is also the power consumption that, and that will be, you need to take into consideration in addition to delays in, you know, and space, space and time. But in any case, the, the, this is the, the cost that we managed to, to prove. And um, I, um, at what time I need to finish, uh, Santos? Do I have time to do a sketch of the proof? Uh, you have uh, like uh, five minutes left. Okay, so good. So I'll do a, a sketch of the proof just to see, you know, how you get this this estimate because otherwise I mean kind of magic, right? Three. Um, so okay, so so here is uh, you know I will do it for the case c equal to one because it's kind of shorter, uh, fit better in the slides, but um, but it's representative of how you proceed here. When you put c equal to one, the polynomial gets like this: one x c, x two c, x three c, plus x five c. So it's not equally spaced just because of this last one here. But take a jump, and uh, there are irreducible, not many, but there are of this shape. Um, for, for different degrees, m equal to 5c. 5c is 2b plus c, right? So 2 times 2c plus c, right? Okay, so this is the polynomial then when you're considering 1x, xb, xb plus 1, that has been considered in the practice before, but now we are fixing the m to be 2b plus 1 that allow us to get a reduction, right? Because it, it, before it has been with an m here, with any m, but now we are fixing an m that will improve the result. So that's okay, this is just one case for us, c equal to one. And, um, and then what is your task? Your task is given a polynomial that has degree at most two m minus two, because you are, you are running over a multiplier. The multiplier multiply two guys of degree m minus one, you get two m minus two. And now you need to bring that thing back to degree smaller than m. So you need to reduce every coefficient that is on the upper half of this resulting product that has degree two m minus two to degree below m. That's your task, that's the, the task. So, okay. And, um, and so the first thing we do is we check how many required reductions you will have, how many times I will have to basically do this division of, of getting you know, one piece and reduce, you know, maybe, maybe I reduce the first time and I already get everything below two and minus two. So, so we show that the number of reduction actually depends on the, const, the coefficient you want to reduce. If you want to reduce the X to the B plus C that is a higher, you may pay three for C bigger than one, but for the example that I'm putting here, a simplification, the, with two passes of this big reduction, you will be done. Everyone will be below M. For the B plus C, what happened for the B coefficient? Two times. For the C coefficients, one in our case here or two in general. So this shows that with this polynomial, we use follow closer a paper by Sonar and Koch, 
1999 that shows this reduction for a generic thing. We are applying for our pentanomial here, and those is the result that you get. Uh, and that shows you that basically you have a polynomial at the beginning that has degree to m minus two. There is a chunk below m that is ready, nothing to do. It's already prepared. And there is a chunk, a, a knot here from m to 2m minus two that is not ready. I need to put it down. So you will grab the leading coefficient here and you will cancel it like you do divisions. And when you cancel it, this A1 will be broken in two pieces, a part that is ready, B2, and a part that is not ready. So it is not, if it is not ready, there is a third stage, but here you stop. At this point, your A3 will be zero and you will be done. And your reduction is right here. It's the sum B0, B1, B2, B3. In our case, because C is equal to one, I only have two of these steps. I don't have the last uh, three here. I will stop here because I two will be zero. So I, my reduction will be B0, B1, B2. And then we go on and check those formulas. The formulas are, are kind of big, but when you, and I am skipping here, sketch of the proof, you need to go to the paper, it give you exact formulas for B0, B1, B2, if you divide by this polynomial, our pentanomial. And so the D red summation of the three fellas, in this case, that A2 is equal to zero, is this. And then you, up to here, we didn't do anything, right? We just divided, right? Now here comes the moment. There is a crucial moment here that you take a look at here and you realize that there are a lot of reductions that happen because there are a lot of re repeated things. There are pieces that are repeated. You need to spend some time. Turns out that the pieces that are repeated can be put it into sort of expressions Tj's, T sub one, T sub two, T sub three, T sub four. And if you plug this T sub one evaluated, G is the exponent here, the shift of the polynomial, you see? So if I have T one of zero, I'm putting zero, so it's just the polynomial from zero to B minus two. And, but if I put some other value, like for example, 2B, then this is you know 2B plus something and so on. So it turns out that, and this is easy to, to check now, because if I give you this, you can plug in the T's and you will see that you get back this horrible thing. So, so but now the point is that this T1, T2, T3, T4 can be computed first and then use it because they, you see here, I'm only using the evaluation of the J at B, at zero, at 2B. These are particular values that are not affecting this. I can do this XOR first, and I can do this XOR first for every I here, for every I there. And once I do that, then I need to do the extra XORs. And if you spend a lot of more time, you can see that actually what is going on is that you can now sort of order the pieces that you are adding. That's the, 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 your, your, your general figure here, tell you how to do the operation. So you, you put the T1 that has certain size from zero to B minus two, minus two here, a T2 is just one value, T1, T2, T3 is just one value. And you do like that. And when you do this, you see that what we are really doing here in these expressions here is actually going over these sums here. And then the only thing I need to do now is count these XORs. You can see that there are two B plus one guys here. So this XOR here, two B plus one XORs, another two B plus one XORs. So four B uh, plus two XORs already. But I also need to pay for the Ts. So I need to pay a B minus one here and a B here. And when you sum all that, you get the six B plus one. That is three M minus two. And that is independent of the polynomial that you are putting. And just because of the shape of the pentanomial. So that gives you the, the source that you will use. If you take a look at the delays, the delays will be three. And that's kind of the expensive part here. And we didn't spend any time on improving the delay. It may be possible to improve it. I don't know. Um, but the delay will be three. So you, you, the, the delay, uh, this is the X delay. There are TA and TX. The TA is the delay in, in an addition and, and the TX is the delay in the exclusive or. And it turns out that we, we need, we have three here. That is more than the other polynomials. The other polynomial have um, a, a, a TX plus three or things like that. So it gets a, a much expensive on delay. Uh, it may be possible to improve it. I don't know. And then the algorithm is straightforward is in the paper for each case of the polynomial. This is for this polynomial here, the simplified polynomial. In this case, you, you show that the algorithm, you give an algorithm is correct and all the things. And the cost is this cost in terms of time and space and, and, and time, um, sorry, space and, and time complexities. Um, OK, and I will skip this part. This was just very short, just saying that there are ways of doing if you want just one irreducible of some degree, do I need to go on this? No, 
you can run a very quick algorithm that will, will detect it, very well studied algorithm. Um, there, is, there are bottlenecks. So you need, if you improve the computations of this X to the Q to the I, so-called iterative Frobenius, uh, if you, because the algorithm requires that. <laughs> you see here, F, a, a, it's a GCD of your polynomial with X to the Q to the I. So you need to get a fast way of doing this. And you can do basic thing, repeated squaring, but that's the, you know, <laughs> there are better ways. And, um, and, um, and it's open really what is the best way to do it. Um, if you want to do it all together. If you want more, you can check the survey by Joachim Konsolgaten and myself. And there are direct constructions that avoid everything. Just give you a theorem that says, this guy is irreducible. <laughs> um, but it works only for a few extensions or for a few degree ends, not for any degree end. Uh, and this goes into mathematics. This is really a, a mathematical thing that comes and said, if you want from a family, I can give you a family of polynomials. We'll skip that, you, you know, it's just a recursion that guarantees that when you, if you start with an irreducible polynomial and you apply the recursion, you obtain an irreducible polynomial and you can apply the recursion as many times as you want. And the degrees jump a lot, jump by a multiplication by three. So here's an example, you can check it later, that if you start with a degree four irreducible over S2, you can produce irreducible degree four times three, 12 times three, 36 times three, 32 times three, 32 times three. So just this example here covers a few degrees of F2. Um, there are other constructions, but uh, not the whole range of degrees. So you, you know, and, and you can actually vary this polynomial by another, and then you have a family of them. But, uh, but you need to be precise, you need in exactly the degree that you can reach with this construction, and there will be a family that you can pick. So if you need, for example, something, not for the previous example, not for hardware or anything, but you need something that you need to, a family of irreducible, you want to vary the irreducible in your method for some reason, I don't know the reason, then with these things, you can have a family of them, that you can go pick in at random from the family and all of them will be reducible the right degree or the right finite field. Currently, nothing to do, no check needed, okay? So it's like having a table of lookup, but per humongous degree that we don't have table lookup. So, yeah. So, okay. And that's, you know, what I was wanting to comment is about the reducibles. There are a lot of open questions Many of these open questions are very hard. They have been around for a long time and, um, and they probably will continue to be around. They are interest for mathematicians because you know, it's kind of interesting to understand. It's like understanding primes, right? We want to understand primes, right? Well, we want to understand irreducible polynomials, the same thing. So, um, because they are the basic components of the polynomials, right? And, and then there are the applications in crypto that now, you know, forget about the mathematical questions, just the application. Then the question is, which are the best polynomial? Well, there are tons of proposals. Uh, some are better on this, worse on that. It's difficult to compare them in a way and all depends on your machine. So in the, the bottom line is, if you need to implement this for some particular degree and some particular you know, uh, polynomial, the, the best thing you're going to do is to you know, check it and see which is the one that works for you because it's not true that because it's a trinomial will be better than a pentanomial or a pentanomial better than a septanomial, there is no truth, right? So you need to really go and, and do your search and decide from there. So in a way, those proposals, um, you know, are not very clear why, why we had them, but these were like 20 years ago. So, okay. And that's kind of what I commented. I, uh, oh, if you want to know more about the, the, the open questions that I said, the mathematical side of this, um, there is this uh, handbook of finite fields that uh, Gary Mullen and myself uh, edited. It's a, it's a thick book, but, uh, but you, you, you have chapters related to these things that I said um, with what is going on in terms of research. What are they? It's not a textbook, this is a research book. So you go there just to see what is the best known, what are the open questions? And then you need to check from the ones, the time that was edited to now, if there was something done. And I left you here some references. Um, this is the paper I refer, the pentanomial I refer with Gustavo and Ricardo. This is the survey that I took a lot of things <laughs> by Fan and Hassan. Um, this is the, if you want to know more about the factorization and in particular irreducibility, test, how I test if the is irreducible, this survey, uh, there are more things, but they, it really contains the methods and the more things are not that many. There have been some improvements, but not a lot of improvements, especially on the how we compute X to the Q to the I mod F 
how we do that operation fast. There have been a huge uh, you know, step there, but you take globally, there have been few new results and all problem, of course, factor in polynomials, quite old problem. And this is the one that I was referring at the end. There are more constructions. This is just one example. If you go to the handbook, there are even more examples. So, so that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. Uh, it was super interesting talk. Um, I don't know if uh, you can see the, we have uh, three questions in the Q&A. I don't know. Uh, if I can. cannot see the question, sorry. Okay, I, I, can, I can read them for you. Um, so the first one is from uh, Eduardo. Um, what he says is that if uh, you have considered an, uh, if you would like uh, to say something about uh, picking monic irreducible polynomials for Galois rings rather than Galois fields? Yeah, so um, so first of all here, uh, yeah, most of the formulas I said, et cetera, are for monic irreducible polynomials uh, and, and in one variable. And um, the, when you are working over F2, it doesn't matter because it will be monic by definition because the, it has to have a one X to the N at the top. So, but when you are in general, if you're not working over F2 or you're not working in a finite field, you're working in a Galois ring, Galois ring, not, not field, then, um, then you have a lot of uh, more freedom to pick the polynomials. Uh, the, the, the studies of Galois ring, I, I couldn't dare to comment. I know, uh, uh, you know some results, but I don't know, for example, what are the current states. There have been a lot of studies on things like F4, I mean, you know, in the equivalent in Z4, um, and also in Z256. Um, in this type of uh, rings, there are, um, there are considerable studies because you see, okay, when you 256 is two to the eight, Two to the eight, uh, you know, uh, is a very important uh, uh, field. For example, a yes, but not only a yes. You know, it's, it's the size of a normal byte. So, um, and uh, there are a lot of things that we do not have there. So, if you are interested on certain type of properties of polynomials, I, I don't want to enter, but differential uniformity for the ones that know, we 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 are really looking for something that have a good differential. Uh, uni uniformity, so it could be good to resist differential attacks in principle, but we don't know. We know zero, right? Polynomial in F, you know working in F two to the eight that will be um, you will have differential uniformity low. That is two. However, if you work on Z of two hundred and fifty three, we do know, and indeed there are there is a paper by Massey that goes to two hundred and fifty seven, and then goes to, to a multiplicative group. So it gets, you know, 256 and then works in, in set to 256 and then you can have very good polynomials. So answering your question, I don't know the details about Galois ring. I can tell you that in some particular Galois rings, um, they, they, they are, you know, they're very interesting, uh, you know, for practical sites because sometimes we cannot have the equivalent result in the Galois field. Um, but my focus has been in, in fields, so so I I, I I wouldn't know the latest results on, on varying varying the polynomials there to non-monic polynomials. I, I I I wouldn't know. Okay, uh, he was also asking if uh, there is any more clever search than using Hansel lifting. Uh, more clever than using sorry. Uh, hence, Hensel lifting. Hensel lifting. Yeah, the, so, so in, yeah, exactly. So Hensel lifting is kind of the, the standard strategy that you use. If you go to books on computer algebra, they, they you know, you go on Hensel lifting things. Um, the, I, 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 I don't know. Let me say I don't know because I, I, I know that there are papers, but I wouldn't know now exactly uh, you know, what is the best way of doing the, the lifting thing, the lifting part of this. Um, the standard way is hands lifting. If you grab books in computer algebra, that's what is explained, you know, even from the very first book there, 
uh, maybe not for Puck, but the first uh, using maple um, by uh, Gonet and you know another people, Lalan, etc. Even there, you will have this you know Hensel lifting procedures. But I don't know if right now you can do better. Yeah, I have I have not worked on this side because I, I as I said I focus more on the field side. So yeah, and in the finite field factorization, that is kind of the the main interesting part. Irreducibility test is just one case of that. And also, you know, if you, you may go to several variables, but when you move into how to use this, for example, for factoring over the rationals, you, know, you want to factor over the rationals, you know, you can factor over the finite fields, right? And then, uh, you know, leave the result to, to the rational. These are standard results. But uh, but I have been interested on the, okay, you are coming to the finite fields, how, what happened there? Instead of, you know, what is the best way of doing this, uh, you know, factoring over rational, for example, um, you know, so I so I wouldn't know about the Hensel lifting latest results. Let me put it like that. That is uh, the correct way of putting it. Okay. Um, yeah, I see there is a, another comment from uh, Rakbendra, but I think it was just like a comment. I don't see any question there. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, uh, that's it. Uh, we can end uh, the talk here. Uh, once again, uh, it was nice to have you as a speaker.